the family and the Campbell family. She told us that her cousin, James Meredith, saw the reconnection of the Merediths and Campbells and the possibilities for healing and overcoming white supremacy as a piece of the final component of his life's legacy. <laughs> Our response to that was, how can coming to the table support him? How can we help your linked families, the Merediths and the Campbells, make sure James Meredith's legacy is known to the world? So here we are. I have lots of thank yous to give, but I'll try to do it briskly. Of course, I'm thankful to James Meredith and to his wife, Judy. I'm thankful to his sons, John and James Henry, to his niece, Meredith Coleman McGee, to his grandniece, Tracy Norris, and to all the extended Meredith family for all the input and encouragement that they've given to bring this program about. I say thanks also to the Campbell family, cousins of the Merediths, to Suzanne Campbell Lowe, to Tissa, Tom, and Patrick Lohr for their video skills, to Glenn Bruce Campbell, and to all the Campbell family members who've been giving encouragement and providing input. Very many thanks go to Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, our joy, who's making today's technology possible, and to Tom DeWolf and Jody Geddes, co-directors of Coming to the Table for everything they've done for our program. And finally, thanks to all the members of the Link Descendants Group who've been giving a lot of enthusiastic encouragement to this project as it's gone along. Suzanne, I need the agenda, please. Our agenda for today is starting with the background of the connected families of James Meredith and J.A.P. Campbell. Then we'll hear about Joseph Abigail Patterson Campbell and the legacy of slavery. We'll hear family reflections. We'll go to audience Q&A and we'll end with a closing reflection from James Meredith. A couple of housekeeping notes. Jody has already mentioned the recording of this program. In addition to the recording, there will be other background documents and another video giving background information that you can pick up at the same time. As we go along today and you have questions, please put them in chat. That's where we'll be taking questions from when we get to the Q&A session. So now let me introduce Suzanne Campbell Lowe, second cousin once removed to James Meredith. She's a member of Coming to the Table and of the Link Descendants Group. She's descended from Josiah Abigail Patterson Campbell and linked to the Meredith descendants through both kinship and enslavement. Suzanne, please. Take us away. Thank you very much, Prinny. And let me screen share and start the presentation. Here we are. Wow. So coming to the table, I want to offer my thanks also to Jody, to Tom, to Prinny. Um, it's just been an amazing experience to work with all of you. Um, so let me start by saying this screenshot here is a picture of our families in April 2021, when we gathered at the home of Meredith Coleman McGee and her husband Will in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it was a lovely afternoon and it was really a, a truly profound event. Um, for many of us, we met each other for the first time. Um, and, you know, as we uh, got together that day, we were sort of taken away from the, uh, with the uh, enormity and the gravity of the event. And we said, we've got to tell our story. Um, first, I want to say the name of Millie Brown, um, who is actually the catalyst for our being together as a family. Um, on the left uh, is J.A.P. Campbell, who enslaved Millie Brown. On the right is James Meredith, 
the great grandson of Millie Brown and J.A.P. Campbell. You know, our story is really not unique in the sense that many families across the USA are connected through the legacy of slavery. But our story is unique in that these two people, each of whom are, were and are famous leaders in their time, they shaped our country's history. It's the story about an iconic black rights activist who's descended from a Confederate leader who was the architect of the Mississippi plan, which created legal and official white supremacy in the South and all the way through to today. And it's a story about how our reconnected families are working together to forge a new future. It's about James Meredith's message that blood is thicker than water. And you'll hear more about that as we go through today's program. And finally, it's about our whole family's message that families are the key to overcoming white supremacy. So let's take a moment to look at the lifetime of work from James Meredith and how he's worked to bring about total citizenship rights for blacks. You have to go back to 1962, almost 60 years ago, when James Meredith became the first black person to attend the University of Mississippi. He was at first denied admission. Then President Kennedy sent troops to quell the riots that ensued. Then he was escorted on campus by federal marshals. And then once in class, he was shunned. Nevertheless, in 1966, he came back and organized a march against fear from Memphis to Jackson, during which he was shot on that march. It was a march to foster black voter registration. And he did come back after that incident, got up out of his hospital bed and finished that march with more than 10,000 civil rights activists. So let's hear now from James Meredith himself about that time in history. You've been quoted many times as saying that you love Mississippi. Some would argue, how can you love a state that has and arguably still is uh, attempting to oppress Blacks and, and other minorities? There have been no accidents in my life. Mm -hmm. Everything has been according to a plan. I went to Ole Miss to break the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I didn't just walk from Memphis to Jackson. I walked from Memphis to Jackson to expose this fear that kept the segregation in place and working. Mm -hmm. Hold on, folks. There we go. So since that time, um, James Meredith has continued his legacy of writing and activism. I mean, talk about courage. You know, he's continued to write several of the screenshots you see here are cover shots of his books. He's continued to make public appearances. And on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you can see a picture of James and his wife, Judy, at the ribbon cutting of his James Meredith Museum in Jackson, Mississippi. On the right-hand side of the picture, on the bottom, is the picture of the article entitled The Father of White Supremacy. And the availability of this article is the way our branch of the Campbell family, the present day Campbell family, learned about our ancestral connection to James Meredith and J.A.P. Campbell. Let's take a closer look at J.A.P. Campbell and his advocacy for white supremacy. You know, he was an esteemed leader in Mississippi. He was a prominent landowner who enslaved many people. He ended his judicial career as the Chief Justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court. And when he died, he was the last living signer of the Confederate Constitution. Now you'll hear some more from James Meredith about J.A.P. Campbell. J.A.P. Campbell was clearly the most influential person in my life. And I think uh, to a large extent in the long history 
of America, J.A.P. Campbell, was a lot of things, but first and foremost, he was a politician, he was a lawyer, uh, and he was a rule maker. He wrote the Mississippi Code of Law of 1880 and was adopted as the Constitution of Mississippi in 1890. It was the Mississippi Constitution of 1890 that established legal and official white supremacy. J.P. Campbell was not only the youngest lawyer uh, admitted to the bar ever in the state of Mississippi, he was the youngest lawyer to win a case in the Supreme Court of the United States. And this case had to do with land ownership. He was the Speaker of the House in Mississippi. The House, the Speaker of the House in Mississippi is the most powerful politician in Mississippi and occasionally rise to be the most important in the country. He was the Speaker of the House when Jefferson Davis was made the senator from Mississippi. Without a J.P. Camel, that probably wouldn't have been a senator, Jefferson Davis. Well, well, you know, given these facts that you've just heard from James Meredith, it's probably no surprise that J.A.P. Campbell was a wealthy landowner. Here's a screenshot of the 1860 slave schedule from Mississippi showing that J.A.P. Campbell owned and, excuse me, enslaved several people. We have found other slave schedules showing that his brother, R.B. Campbell, also enslaved many people. You know, he clearly believed that whites were superior and blacks were inferior. And he said so repeatedly and publicly throughout his life. Um, these are some excerpts on your screen from his writings when he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And I know they're too small to read right now, but these and other historical images and some of his writings will be available on the Coming to the Table website after the program. Let's hear again from James Meredith as he shares more insights about J.A.P. Campbell's life. J.A.P. Campbell had two families. He had the European family, and he had the Black family. He lived the last part of his life more with his non-white family. He owned not only the biggest plantation in Otella County, he owned the most advanced. He spent a lot of time after he retired in Atala County, he raised my father. He hired my father, his grandson, had the only industrial job of black head in Atala County. What was the impact that slavery had on the legacy of J.A.P. Campbell? Blood is thicker than water. That's a statement that I heard much of my life, particularly in my younger life. And it was J.A.P. Campbell, before he died, that made arrangements with uh, the people who sold my father the land that they would. J.A.P. Campbell was written out of history, not because he didn't believe in white supremacy, he clearly did. The Mississippi hardliners wanted blacks totally out of politics. Prom Oops. Sorry, folks. Primarily because of the theory that if blacks could vote, that it would split the white 
vote. So the theory for the hardliners in Mississippi was to eliminate the, the black vote totally, to disfranchise them, which they did. J.A.P. Campbell did not go along with that theory. He wanted to establish white supremacy by giving votes according to the land ownership uh, as opposed to race. The hardliners wrote him out of history because they didn't want that mm -hmm. idea even passed along. Right. J.A.P. Campbell had the desire to establish a class of yeoman farmers. That meant middle class. I mean, that's what a yeoman farmer was like a successful businessman. And that's what he set out to do. And that's why they wrote him out of history. Thank you for, uh, for that, um, Mr. Meredith. And I think what we'll do now is switch to hearing from my dear cousin, Meredith McGee. Okay, yes. Um, J.P. Father Robert Bunn Campbell uh, graduated from Princeton Theological College. And uh, J.P. also graduated from Davidson College at age 15, which is very significant during this time because um, only the elite and, and wealth are really getting college educations. Um, his uh, grandfather, Josiah Patterson, was a wealthy planter from Abbeville, South Carolina. He started off 1790 with two slaves and 30 years later, he had um, 21 slaves. And J.A.P. Campbell himself by, by uh, 1860 owns 1911 slaves. And he was, as my uncle said, the speaker of the house, a very powerful position of uh, next. Okay. In terms of legacy, legacy is an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. And slavery is a civil relationship whereby one person has absolute power over another and controls his or her life, liberty, and fortune. And in terms of the legacy of J.P. Campbell did not leave any of his black descendants anything in his will. Next, please. Um, the uh, JP's upland started coming to uh, from Ireland to um, America in um, during colonial America. Samuel Patterson was the first to come. I like to say he came. He was an immigrant that came to this country with a potato, and he accumulated 350 acres of land, six slaves, and wealth, and he was able to pass it down to his descendants. And at that time, uh, we had land grants, which was the oh, best kind of wealth you could ever I'm assuming you want me to just um, use earbuds, right? When we get inside, okay. Um, please, because oh, I've got to give her a treat and take her out. Okay. You Could okay you mute that? yourself if you're not speaking, please? Okay, as I was saying, which is the, uh, the kind of uh, welfare, land grants was the kind of welfare that sustains generations economically. Next slide, please. This is just a, 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 a image of where our, our bloodline comes from, the white bloodline from down Ireland. And they were the third wave of immigrants which came to South Carolina. Next. Next. OK, so. Uh, they were promised the American dream, which is resources, wealth, a good life, milk and honey. And the promise was fulfilled. Next. Uh, I want to point out that as early as the 1600s, Ireland's economy was controlled uh, with penal laws. And the Protestants, which our upland were Protestants, were at the top of the economic ladder and Catholics at the bottom. Catholics could not vote, hold office, 
or send their children abroad to be educated. Next slide. This is an image of the uh, white class structure in the South 1860. About 17% of um, whites are one to nine slaves, 6.6% on 10 to 99, and just 1% owned over 100 slaves. Next. In 1860, there were 4 million enslaved Africans in the United States with a market value of $3.6 billion. Next. This is an image of slaves around King Cotton, and of course, they're seated, subjugated. And the white men are standing, they benefit from the our labor. Next. And um, preparing for this presentation taught me the real reality of how the pen is mighty than the sword. And this proverb means writing is more effective than military power or violence. And our uh, a JP and uh, his family participated in this power by being able to write tax law, criminal law, constitutional law. <laughs> Next. This is just a, a, a map of uh, America showing that it is expanding from when Samuel Patterson came here during colonial times. And this land grant welfare is steady going on. Um, the white immigrants are getting the land and uh, enslaved Africans are working the land and was creating this wealth gap. Next. Uh, I wanted to mention our Pattersons also come from South Carolina. We, we go back as far as Caroline Patterson and she was born in uh, South Carolina, 1819. And we, uh, and we have no pictures of Caroline Patterson at all. Next. Uh, in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, uh, the Yergers, uh, who uh, J.P. Campbell's daughter married into this family, they are the printers for the uh, state of Mississippi with this very significant economic. Next slide. I just wanted to point out that uh, J.P. was also involved in, mil in the military courts. Next. And this is my great grandmother, Frances Brown. She was born at the end of slavery. And the one thing that she did get from her father was an education. Um, she was a school teacher, next slide, when she married my great grandfather, Ned Meredith. But her education at that time didn't necessarily help her economically like it did her white counterparts because Ned Meredith was illiterate. And he was a sharecropper, so she married a sharecropper, and she ended up there at the bottom of society, um, like her mother in a different way. Next slide. Uh, but the social capital for J.P. Campbell's white children is completely different. Uh, Nanny um, marries a yoga. Her father-in-law owns 120 slaves. He's part of the 1%. And her grandson becomes a certain cut judge, just like her uh, uh, relatives. Next slide. And uh, J.P. Jr., uh, he has a publishing company in the marketplace. And also, he has an interest in a large plantation. So he's making money off of sharecroppers. Next. And this is a picture of sharecropping, of a sharecropping family, and all sharecroppers were literally poor. Next slide. Um, Edward Meredith and Sam Cobb are both the Meredith's uplines. Uh, Edward Meredith, by surname, comes from him. They both fought in the War of 1812. They were both promised things by the government and uh, Edward Meredith benefited. He got some land grant welfare to the tune of 698 acres. Sam Cobb, Choctaw, he got nothing. Had to leave his log cabin and hide out in the woods. 
to avoid being forced to go to Oklahoma, which was the new territory for Indians. Next slide, please. Uh, you can skip that one because I think you already mentioned that one earlier. And um, this was the census record, just really how I determined uh, that Millie Brown was born in 1844 and she was about 21 when Millie was born. I mean, Francis was born and we have no picture of her either. That's legacy of slavery. Um, costs us a lot. Next. And this is the, the will of uh, JP. And I'm just going to point out a couple of things. He, he, he has accumulated, uh, most of his money was accumulated through uh, his law practice. And of course, I'm sure he accumulated some from the slaves. But uh, he gave uh, $12,000 to one of his daughters, $14,000 to the other one. And the books were divided. Well, of course, this is uh, 1917. And at this time, more 80% or more of Blacks in the state of Mississippi didn't even have a booking house because they, they were, most of them were illiterate at this time. Next slide. And <clears throat> this is 2009, and uh, Uncle Jay Boy and Uncle Claudio are, are walking uh, there in Tuckwilder, Mississippi. They're actually down the street from where Emma Till's body was handled. And he's using his voice to say, hey, 144 years after slavery, we still have generational poverty in the Mississippi Delta. Next. And this was a memoir that I found of uh, one of the Yorkers. Next. <clears throat> Uh, Ned and Francis's children, uh, only two of them were able to buy any land, and this is the first time they had a farm business in the 1920s. Uh, Alberta, the oldest, she bought 40 acres. Granddad kept about 84, and they have, uh, this is their first time having anything in the market besides their labor. Uh, next. And uh, of Granddad Cap's children, uh, about three of them bought land. Uncle Jabo bought his father's farm, Ain't a Burgess farm, it's more than to the tune of 127 acres. Uncle Everybody's land, I'm not sure how much. And my mother Hazel, she bought 40 acres. Next. So uh, this is just about my last slide. I, I in my research, I saw where about 16% of black millennials in this country today own even a house, which takes us back to the uh, World War II low records of home ownership. And land and our home ownership are usually a family's greatest assets at the beginning of wealth creation. And I just wanted to say that um, our, our uh, story is similar to these uh, statistics, that it's up to us to be able to change the future and uh, we're, we're just light years behind our uh, J.P. Campbell's white descendants in terms of wealth and the American dream of milk and honey. So let's change the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith, for amazing research and for, you know, simply put, reminding us all uh, about how wealth disparities exist today as a result of the legacy of slavery. Now we have two more sets of reflections from various family members. I'd like to first introduce my cousin, Glenn Bruce Campbell, who will talk a little bit about what he's done with our family's legacy. You're still muted, GB, so you should unmute yourself now. Thank you. And Thank I'll you, advance Sam. the slides for you. Just let say next when you're ready, GB. Will do, thanks. So I took this coat of arms from the Duke's coat of arms painted on a highly ceiling in Scotland. And uh, to our future is James Meredith's typical book inscription. And the Campbells are coming has been in, uh, used on the, it's a song that inspires courage on the battlefield. My name, next slide. My name is Glenn Bruce Stewart Campbell, but I'm called GB by most. I took this picture in two, uh, 2016 to prove I had a better beard than J.A.P. Right, next yeah. slide. About 1985, there was a reunion in Mobile, Alabama of my grandfather's generation. 
in preparation, I copied the Campbell coat of arms from the Auburn University Library and handmade a few t-shirts. I airbrushed one and gave it to my grandfather, Boozy, in the center. He's wearing it. Uh, I'm on the left. He wore it at the reunion. One evening in 1999, he was heard rustling through his closed doors to change into that t-shirt. He passed that night. I now have that shirt. Next pick. Next slide, please. Suzanne? Yes, do thanks. you see the, yeah, you see it? Yeah, thanks. So uh, back to the watching crest, please. Yep, there's a little delay, but it's there. No, okay, got it, thanks. All right, Boozy willed JAP's retirement gift for his service on the bench to me, an 1895 gold Elgin pocket watch. After restoration in 2009, the timepiece ticked insistently. The engraved inscription of J.A.P. Campbell guided my internet searches for timely clues about my great, great, great grandfather. Next. On reading the two page forward to the father of white supremacy, any ticking was replaced by heart pounding. If James Meredith had stopped after the first four sentences, it would have been dreadful. But what followed was a hopeful story of kinship and a clear call to individual responsibility modeled by family. Then on page J three, J.H. states, I can't, he came from an ancestral line illustrious in the history of the British Isles. His ancient forebears established the House of Argyle and were among the Scottish chiefs with their numerous shields, tartans, and coats of arms. One had little difficulty when noting his magnificent frame and lofty, well-poised head and recalling such names as Bruce and Wallace. I had to meet James Meredith. Next picture, please. The first time was in July. Later that same year, the watch was restored at the Two Sisters restaurant in Jackson. I presented J.H. with the purest token of family I had, a sterling silver clan Campbell crest. It was circumscribed with our motto, Ne Oblivis which is Gallic for do not forget. Our motto perfectly fits with my appreciation for J.H. living that charge more faithfully than any Campbell I know. Knowing from whom you come is supposed to be a blessing. While standing on the porch after lunch, my seven-year-old son looked up at Mr. Meredith, who bent down to better hear the boy. R.A. asked, may we call you cousin? With a broad grin, J.H. straight and saying, oh, yes, oh, yes. And from then on, we have affectionately called him cousin. Next slide, please. 10 years later, in 2019, J.H. invited me to Middle Tennessee State University, where he first publicly spoke of our shared lineage at a Black History Month event in his honor. Weeks before his speech, he asked my opinion of his notes. I said it was a fine draft. He humbled me with the privilege of a place at the table of honor, even at his right hand. Next slide, please. In October of that same year, my dreams of Scotland finally became the real for the first time too. What we experienced exceeded expectation was far beyond our ability to plan. Inverary is the home of the Clan Campbell Chief, the 13th Duke of Argyll. The grounds hold the largest private archive in Scotland with the most extensive collection of original Campbell documents in the world. Among these treasures are precious details of lives that we would do well not to forget. My ideas about a visit to the Campbell, uh, the castle resulted in an awkward letter petitioning his grace as my clan chief. Uh, I asked for the extraordinary for my sons, fly fishing in the river area for Ian and a view from the top of the castle for Ari. Both were denied, but with generous explanations. For myself, I asked for the Duke's signature in a biography of my favorite clan chief and got a signed bottle of clan Campbell scotch. But my most ambitious request was as follows. Your grace's consideration of accepting for the Campbell archive a few rare and unknown documents conveying an American and uniquely Southern Campbell story where the need for ne obliviscaris is inborn. Josiah Abigail Patterson Campbell was not only the youngest signatory of the letters of secession on behalf of Mississippi for the Confederacy, but subsequently the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Mississippi after Reconstruction. This extraordinary direct ancestor may have been forgotten in my family had not James H. Meredith, the first black man to graduate from Ole Miss, who with the support of JFK and the US military, 
persevered through what is known as the last gasp of the Civil War. He wrote a work intended to draw a Campbell, like myself, to him through his claim of knowing more about J.P. Campbell than any man alive. Next picture, please. Despite my audacious letter, we were received gracefully. Allison, the archivist for the Agala Estates, welcomed us for a wonderfully generous hour and a half where we shared the extraordinary details of our story. A black leather folio with a print of J.H.'s work on J.A.P., including some photographs, was submitted and accepted. The word clan in Scotland simply refers to a group of cousins where power and influence is inextricably linked to the privilege of family. So for those who seek the blessings of not forgetting the Campbells that came before, there's a place where the stories of the greatest among our clan admonish our memories in Inverary. And cousin J.H. is among them. Next picture. In a letter to cousin before that first lunch in 2009, I wrote him the following as encouragement. And you can see it sticking out of the pocket behind that in his front pocket, right behind the, the glasses protected. This is what I said. We live in a culture where few exist who both value and are responsible enough to pass down any story of family, much less be inspired to follow the call of heritage and heroism in the face of persecution. You are one of the few. I have been blessed by your stories in ways you cannot imagine, but I'm sure you know this is part of the joy of sharing a familial story. Your story is very much now my story. Children are emulators by nature. The truth of Proverbs 22, six should impress us. Train up a child in the way he should go so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Lead by example. Our cousins are among the finest to follow. So I encourage all of us to embrace the charge given by cousin who every book that he's ever written, uh, inscribed his name in calls us to our future. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be engaged. Thank you so much, GB. I'm gonna stop the screen share right now and introduce my cousin, Tracy Norris. Tracy, would you like to speak now? Yes, hello everyone. I'm Tracy Norris. I currently live in San Diego. California. I am the third great granddaughter of J.E.P. Campbell and the great niece of James Meredith. When I was first asked if I'd be interested in speaking, providing my reflections, I initially said no because I didn't think I'd have much input because of uh, where I live, or where I lived. I grew up in Detroit. My cousin Meredith said that I should give my perspective because I was raised in the North. So I'm going to give you my Northern reflection. I remember my great uncle James coming to visit us many times growing up and I was happy to see him, but more excited to see Joseph and James and later Jessica. He always had his kids in tow and he would always talk to me about something related to family, finances, or education. Most of the time, I wasn't really interested in what he had to say because he was usually interrupting whatever I was doing. There was no segue. He'd just start at what I considered to be inopportune times, like when I was watching cartoons on Saturday because back then they only came on, on Saturdays. But I will give my Uncle James credit for trying to educate me on important issues, whether or not I listened. Yes, I knew my uncle had integrated Ole Miss wherever and what, whatever that was to me at the time. I attended Polish Catholic school for 12 years where I thrived and I was popular and I never had any issues of which I was aware. And it wasn't until high school that I slowly began to realize the significance of what my uncle did. I remember watching an episode of Jeopardy and the answer was he integrated Ole Miss in 1962. And I was like, wow, they had a question about my Uncle James and on Jeopardy, no less. Then when I turned 18 and started college and November rolled around, my grandmother, his sister, 
asked me if I'd voted and I casually said, no, I didn't. And I swear in all of my life, I had never seen my grandmother so angry and at me, her one and only golden grandchild. I can't say everything she said because there were quite a few expletives, but to summarize, she said, your uncle almost died so that you could have the right to vote and how dare you not take your mm -mm -mm to the polls. Needless to say, she woke me up that day and I've remained woke and voted faithfully ever since. I will end by saying that the significance of what my uncle achieved continues to mean more to me as I grow older and wiser. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for your remarks, Tracy. Um, I'd like to now introduce my cousin, John Meredith, who will help us with some of the Q&A for our presentation at this time. John. Hello and thank you. Uh, I am John Meredith, the uh, oldest son of James Meredith, um, my brother and uh, another son of our father, who is my father's namesake. Uh, brother James is also uh, participating today and I don't get to see him so that much. So I wanna say, hey, James, uh, <laughs> while I have the opportunity. I'm also the great, great grandson of J.A.P. Coleman. Um, I currently mm -hmm. am a city council representative here in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, at this point, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm looking in the wrong place. Jody, perhaps you could help. That is correct. We currently don't have any questions in the chat. And so folks, feel free to go ahead and add those questions and then we'll bring it up for you. I'm sure it's an exciting presentation. So I know there's some questions brewing or even comments so that we can share those out to the larger group. And of course, Bill, welcome to ask uh, my cousins Meredith, GB or Tracy uh, questions pertaining to their, their talks as well. And so I see a hand raised and there's a question that's dropped. It was sent directly to me. <laughs> um, so I'll actually add it for everyone to see. Um, so the question is, how did you find each other in this era? And that's from Lori Van Loon. How did you find each other in this era? And Betsy, I see your hand. So once we have this question answered, I'll pass it over to you, Betsy. Sounds good. I'm going to actually steer this one uh, to cousin Suzanne, uh, who is my answer to that question. How did we find each other? Well, I found out uh, through the Campbells uh, because of the, the tireless efforts of uh, my cousin Susan Lowe. So Susan, uh, would you like to tell the full story? Absolutely. Um, I had been a big time genealogy buff in my family and um, uh, along around 2005, I was uh, visiting with a cousin and she passed across the table to me an article called The Father of White Supremacy. Uh, I read the article and was completely overwhelmed at how much more about my great great grandfather, J.A.P. Campbell, uh, I could read than I had ever been told by my own family members. Um, I was, I had, I, I had to call James Meredith. And I kind of worked on it for about a week. I was kind of afraid to do so. Uh, I found his phone number online and dialed the number. My heart was pounding. And I said, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Meredith, my name is Suzanne Campbell Lowe. Um, I've done some genealogy research. I found your article. I believe we might be cousins. And there was a very long pause and he said, meanwhile, my heart was pounding even louder. He said, well, I've been waiting for this call for 50 years. And, you know, I was so relieved to, to know that I wasn't going to be hung up on, but we actually spoke for about an hour that day and continued talking over the years. Um, you know, we attended his, uh, this unveiling of his statue, um, uh, at Ole Miss in 2006. Uh, we attended his 
uh, award from the Harvard Graduate School of Education in Boston uh, in 2013 um, for actually on his birthday. And um, we've just continued to work together, be together as family. Um, but that was the first time I believe any uh, White Campbell had publicly um, acknowledged the connection to the Merediths. Thank you, John, for that question. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, it is at that um, statue unveiling at the campus of Ole Miss where I actually uh, caught up with Suzanne and uh, Brother James was, was there as well. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was just great. Uh, the, yeah. the reason we were there was pretty neat. And then to find out uh, about the other side of the family and actually meet them was, uh, was frankly an honor. So. Um, heck of a day yeah. <laughs> or a weekend, actually. Yes. All right. Um, I see Dina Lee has asked, I have lots of Scottish descendants who are named Campbell and other relatives who were slave owners named Good, Good with an E at the end. Um, and the Goods apparently also married uh, to the, into the Campbell clan. How do I go about finding Black descendants to whom I might be related? Well, I would say between um, Suzanne and Meredith Coleman McGee, um, that's probably gonna be the, the best resources I know of. Um, and they can probably steer you uh, to places where you can get more information, but Meredith is, and, and, and Suzanne have just worn out a path uh, on the genealogy. Uh, yeah. So that's, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Uh, would either of you like to chime in with suggestions on how she might find out more about her Black descendants? The one would be to uh, uh, check the uh, county uh, for names and uh, uh, census records, that, which are free uh, for 1867. And some counties have all of the uh, names of slaveholders listed publicly. For every county in this country, yes. And, and Suzanne, you want to answer? Yeah, I would actually suggest for this person to connect with Prinny Anderson and the Linked Descendants Group from Coming to the Table, which is a, a, a really valuable resource with tons of examples, research lines. Um, Prinny, do you want to make some comments about that? Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I would actually make the recommendation and Tom DeWolf just put um, a URL in chat to go to the website, Our Black Ancestry and get in touch with Sharon Morgan. That is her specialty is helping African-Americans find their black ancestors and helping European Americans learn more about people that their ancestors had enslaved. And she's done amazing work and helped a lot of people make those connections. Ourblackancestry.com. Thank you so much. Um, I've noticed there's been some direct message questions. Of course, I cannot see those. So if you could uh, share one of those with yes. me now, that would be great. No Thanks worries. And we've changed the chat feature because we have a lot of questions coming in at once. That's and fine. so we, right we now- We do have the hand raised. Yes. So let's pass okay. it over to Betsy and then I can go to the next question that I have here from Eugene. So Betsy, I'm going to head and ask you to unmute. I know you're on your phone, Betsy. If you're having some challenges, you can also press star six. That might also help you. All right, no worries. Let me know when you're able to unmute. With that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and ask this question that I have here from Eugene Hill that says, I was 11 years old in 1962, living in Macon, New Bucks County. I remember there was talk that other light-skinned African-Americans may have matriculated at Ole Miss 
did not graduate, though not graduated. Does Mr. Meredith remember any talk about this? Let's drop uh, that question in the chat as well. Yeah, to, to my knowledge, no, um, no. Okay. And then I see another question that says, can you speak to any challenging moments when you got pushback in denial of these links, perhaps from people who are not on this call or supportive of our mission? So kind of what was the pushback and denial maybe of this particular history? I'll have to defer to Suzanne on that one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, John. Um, absolutely. There has been um, a spectrum of responses. Um, some of our white family members um, believe that we have pushed our name, our J.A.P. Campbell ancestors name through the mud. Um, that's a direct quote. Um, they, they just don't want to uh, believe that uh, J.A.P. Campbell could have um, had children outside of his marriage vows. Um, but it, in fact, it was a fairly common practice um, in the Civil War days um, beforehand as well. It's, you know, it doesn't mean that it's a, a, a laudable thing to do, but it's there, there have been people who did not want to know that. Um, secondly, I was also asked to wonder why didn't Mr. Meredith prove his lineage through taking a DNA test? Um, this was shocking to me, given that my own claim of cousinhood was never questioned. Uh, I, I would only imagine that it was because I, I was white and I said, hi, uh, I'm descended from J.A.P. Campbell and so are you. Um, so both of those examples, I believe are they're just manifestations of denial, of discomfort. Um, there are a lot of people who um, find this to be a frightening topic, um, but I have, to, I have to remind them that I don't need proof like a DNA test. Um, if I had any doubts that the, the whole foundation of love overcomes any of that, and I never had any doubts. so. This is, it's all good. Being connected to the Merediths has been one of the most profound uh, experiences of my whole life. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, it's hard to follow that up, but <laughs> I'll just throw out the fact that uh, Glenn Bruce's trip to the motherland, if you will, and the, uh, the accepting of the document, uh, basically making that assumption assertion was um, accepted so I, I I think that's a pretty strong indication yeah. that there is a familial yeah. tie there thank you all for sharing that someone else also asked have you posted your family tree all branches on ancestry.com or another website I will once again defer to our genealogical wow. crew uh, <laughs> in Suzanne and Meredith yeah. uh, um, I am um, a late to the late to the table on ancestry.com. Yes, I have a family tree up there. Um, but actually, what we're planning to do is start another website, probably something that's going to be around the father of white supremacy, where we will publish a family tree, not of living people, um, but one that will include all the Merediths. I personally have all the Merediths in my family tree. I just haven't published it to Ancestry, that's all. And how about you, Meredith? I, I have um, a family tree and I have J.P. Campbell um, above Francis, but I can't put Millie beside him because they only let you put the wife beside him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can show you how to do that. I can, yeah, you actually can do that. So I just haven't published it to Ancestry, but I do have that. Next question. Thank you all for that. The next question that I'm seeing here, and if I'm missing your question, it is not intentional. There are many things rolling through in this chat. So the question I see here from Roslyn is what does it mean to you, John, to live in the current culture of laws written to continue voter oppression or make it harder to vote in America? Great question. Um, it, it's awkward, uh, to be honest with you. 
um, for uh, lots of reasons. Um, one, um, voting, um, as Tracy alluded to, means an awful lot in our family. Um, Dad was, uh, you know, almost killed for that. And in fact, was pronounced dead by Walter Cronkite, who was the news uh, during that time frame. Um, so uh, voting is, is, is something. Uh, I look at Dad's body of work and while um, Ole Miss certainly instilled in me as a child and as an adult to this day, that uh, education is very important and you have to fight for an education tooth and nail, um, but they'll kill you if you try to vote uh, and if you try to participate in the public policy process. So to actually be fortunate enough to have been elected uh, to office at a time when voting rights is under attack um, is a very challenging uh, time and mission for me. Um, I am in Alabama, so I'm part of that Southern state um, um, drive, we'll call it, although it's not exclusive to the South, of, of we'll say minimizing the opportunities for mostly people of color, um, although it's not exclusively tied to color. If you're a poor white person, um, then, then these affect these laws and changes affect you as well. So, you know, to me and what I have gleaned in my way too many years of, of life um, is that um, American democracy is based on as many people participating as possible. And what is happening now, at least in my opinion, is one political party that is uh, waning is trying to be able to change the rules of the game so that they can actually rule from the minority and not have to worry about um, getting a majority anymore. Um, so, and I'm distinctly troubled by that, particularly since I'm part of the group that they want, want to keep the vote from. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's problematic, it's troublesome. Um, we're also living in a time where there is uh, animosity toward possibly among police uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, minorities. Um, and that's also something that's reared its head uh, during my, my term in office. So um, very challenging times to be an elected official. Um, but some of the beauty is that there's hope. Uh, maybe that's because in Alabama at the municipal level where I am, um, there is no party affiliation. It, it, it's no party, it's nonpartisan. So we are actually able to work together and we don't have party affiliations that say, if you meet with me, then you're gonna be ostracized by your party and your fundraising dries up and all of that stuff. That, that doesn't happen at our level. So we're actually able to work um, pretty, pretty in sync. Um, there's yeah, really not right. much that comes through our, right. our council that, that isn't an overwhelming majority. <laughs> No, you backed up. Don't need any further than this. It's all right. We can move on to the next question. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question. I'm wondering what you all see the role of young people as in family history and storytelling. Um, and also, how do you plan on engaging young people? That could be young people in the community or the young people in your family. Well, um, young people, is. It's, that's what's going to keep it alive. If the young people don't know, uh, then the history fades away and, and, and knowledge is, is lost. So any, any sort of gains that we're making now, bringing the white family uh, and the black family trees or, or branches together um, is, is always a jeopardy of the next generation not sustaining it. So children are, and, and, and youth are, are, the future. <laughs> I know it's a somewhat cliche, but it, it truly is uh, the ability to hold on to our culture, our heritage, and, uh, you know, um, in, in this particular case, two branches of the tree that are only branches because of race can be brought together. And it's, uh, it's a great time to do that. I mean, America needs uh, a lot of coming together. And frankly, if it is individual families acknowledging there are other branches um, that could go a long way in, 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 in saving this country. Um, and I don't say that as if, you know, in the next five months or something, America's gonna fall apart. But in terms of maintaining what America is and the potential and in, in the, uh, the future of generations being able to attain the American dream, 
the, the, the youth is, 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 has to engage. Uh, they have to engage politically. They have to engage in education. Um, they have to get the best education they can uh, at the highest level that they can. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, they, they have to be involved in so many things. I know uh, dad is working on getting the church um, to um, recommit to uh, doing a lot of things as a family and having the parents take a more active role uh, in, frankly, most aspects of their children's lives. And that would be another opportunity through the churches uh, for young people to not only um, um, hear about and, and understand their histories and the potential that they have on changing or bettering uh, those futures. Um, church is a great place to start. And it's also a great place to hone those leadership skills that they're gonna need in order to be the next James Meredith, in order to be the next J.A.P. Campbell, so that they can make the gains that they have more institutional. Um, because right now it's the, inst I shouldn't say exclusively, but institutions are a very large part in what is perceived as American racism. Um, so until the institutions uh, start to change their policies, it's, it's a lot harder to actually change the day-to-day -day life of individuals. I would like to add to that. Um, it's very challenging uh, to teach our youth our history because we live in an era where there are book bans. I mean, even Maya Angelou books have been banned in the state of Mississippi a few years ago. And um, critical race theory, uh, actually, from my perspective as a black author in the state of Mississippi who works with children through Community Library of Mississippi, we have two generations of blacks who the history has been lost to. So catching up on that is, 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 is um, extremely uh, challenging and also the very laws that were put into place 1865 to fund the white schools better than the black schools is still in existence across the country. So that is another problem that cannot be changed unless it's with the power of the pen because the, the, the power of the, the pen is, 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 is the reason why uh, the, the black race is, is the majority of the black race is at the bottom educationally and economically. It's, uh, it's, uh, we have a lot of work to do and it all hands on deck. Every, everything that anybody could do to cure this is needed right now. Thank you, Mayor Thank Meredith. You. Is uh, Rosalind, honesty, yeah. is, if you can unmute and ask your question, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, the question I'd like to ask you is, um, how important do you feel the conversation of the mulatto or in a current movie now passing how important do you consider those conversations um, to be had between African-Americans as well as um, descendants of, of enslavers where there, you can't deny how the country grew and prospered from slavery. You can't deny you know, how life came into being <laughs> that looks just like you know, the slave owner, you know, you know what I mean? Um, so how important do you think uh, that conversation is to move the ball further past the black and white of slavery into something that's a little more current? I that have could to be more appealing to young people like mixed uh, race, uh, children being bullied and you know, just the understanding of, of what that means and that, that plight. You, you broke up a, a, a fair amount, uh, but I think I have the gist of your question being, um, how do we extend the conversation 
um, to include uh, mulattoes, uh, children of a white parent and a black parent, um, uh, at least is my loose uh, definition of mulatto. Um, is that correct? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what I'm talking about is the passing as white. That was the culture for some African Americans and how that is most representative of, can you still hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how that's most representative of what you can't deny. We're linked descendants. Wow. Does that, that make more that, sense? It, that, that, that makes a, a world of sense. It's a great question. Unfortunately, I have never been able to pass. Um, so I, I am unaware of, of what it takes to do that in the toll uh, that it takes to do that. Um, it is funny you mentioned that. I was actually um, uh, watching uh, something. I was watching something else and it talked about the movie where uh, the little girl then grows up to be a woman passes this white. Um, I, I forget the name of it. Um, but I guess I, I say all that to say is I really, I really can't speak to that. Um, is there anyone on the call that might be able to, uh, to, to, to really say something of, of significance? Because all I can, can truly say about that is that I think they definitely need to be included. I think, um, um, you know, even those that may not be able to pass for white, um, still have that same um, or some of those same issues in terms of who they are as individuals, since half their DNA is white. Um, but I, 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 I just don't know that world and, and frankly can't imagine it. So if anybody can, can chime in on that, please speak up. May I make an oh. offer as we um, enter into closing up our Q&A? Oh, sure. I think no two worries. things. One I'll say is that I encourage folks, if you're not connected to a local group, Tom is going to drop the link again, get connected, because I think it's an opportunity to have these conversations at a deeper level more than what we have time for today. So that's one thing that I would offer, definitely getting connected to the Link Descendants Working Group as well. And I think the last thing I'll say is being able to create space where we can have conversations about trauma and internalize racial oppression because we talk about these things on a systemic level. And yet there are impacts on how we build our identity and how we begin to shape and see ourselves in relationship to the world. And so once again, in our conversations, I think about race also talking about <laughs> the impact of trauma on one's um, identity. And there are a few books like My Grandmother's Hands that people often speak to that I think allows us to have a more complex conversation about this um, and continue to also examine the impact of state violence on people's bodies that often push them into an atmosphere of passing even during our times. And so once again, I say all of that, opening up a can of worms, um, to say that I think there is opportunity in local groups and working groups to really dig deeper into the complexity um, of these issues. So I encourage us to keep talking about it and to keep thinking about it. There's some incredible links that folks are dropping in the chat. And with that being said, I'll pass it back over to Suzanne and the group. Yeah. Thank you so if much. If I can Jim. jump in here on that question of passing is white. Uh, someone said that uh, the new movie called Passing uh, is an excellent example. Um, and uh, another person said my, uh, my grandmother's hands uh, is a good book um, addressing those issues. And I think what I was referring to, I think the title is An Imitation of Life, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Thank you. Thank you, yes, John. Thank you mm -hmm. for facilitating those questions, John. Um, I, uh, we could talk about this all for, for, well, for the rest of our lives. Um, mm -hmm. What I'd like to do now is to share screen again and to um, help us have some final remarks from Mr. Meredith himself. There we go. We're going to wrap up now. Um, I'd like very much to say thank you to coming to the table for being our amazing partners for this program. The question was asked in the beginning of our creating this event was, can family love be the beginning of racial healing? And we say, yes, a big resounding yes. And we'd like to share 
James Meredith's final remarks today about that topic. It takes a lot of courage to buck the system. The legacy of slavery and the consequences of segregation are the most important thing dealing with the black white race issue. The worst thing that has happened to human civilization is separation. The most known about separation in the Bible was the leprosy. But the big difference between the leprosy colony and the black white separation. Once you were cured of leprosy, you could re enter the regular colony. Mm. But with the color separation by race, once you assign to the secondary or the unaccepted colony, no matter what else happens, you can never re-enter. And the coming together of the blood would be, in my opinion, as good a start as could be made. From boyhood, I had three assignments. I call them missions from God. And the first two, and number one was to expose or uh, break the system of white supremacy. Of course, that ain't hardly a reality. The second mission was to expose and challenge the fear that kept the separation operative. But the most important part of my mission from God was the last mission which is to raise the moral character of the people. And I believe that the only answer that come up satisfactorily is God and the pursuit of righteousness. And that's the teachings of Jesus Christ. That is the mission that I'm on now. The difference between good and bad, between uh, right and wrong. And uh, that's uh, what can be done. And nothing can get that done better than families because blood is indeed thicker than water. It's, it's very interesting to hear you talk about uh, uh, the size of family and how you can build on the nuclear family with, with others that you bring into the family. It seems just so perfectly matched for this entire presentation by coming to the table in that we, as the black side of the Campbell family, know who we are. We know we are family. The white side of the of the J.P. Campbell family knows that they are family. Know that they are descendants of J.P. But the coming together of the white side and the black side is what coming to the table is all about. Could you talk about how? you see the two sides coming together in your lifetime, what that means to you and what you think other families in America joining us in that coming together means to the future of America. What I heard my father say much of my developing life, 
is that the problems of race and discrimination, separation and segregation, which is separation, uh, <clears throat> would come to an end or improve when the families come together. I know in my case, I literally have never not known about my white relatives. And I know scores of black families just like mine. I mean, but for political and safety and other reasons, the white sides uh, felt that they could not acknowledge or let it be known or certainly not let it be talked about that they had black relatives. And, but that I believe is now a thing of the past. And I believe that if families such as the Meredith's and the Campbell's bridge this gap, and I think they're in a better position to bridge it than just most other people, that it will make it easier for America to become the place that I think America want to become. Definitely the place where what, what, how they say it, all men are created equal. Yeah, uh, that's it. The, the, this revelation can open America up in ways that America has never been opened before. Dad, you mind telling me a little bit more about your current mission? I know it has to do uh, with with the church, um, but it, the it's a focus, as I understand it, on parents uh, becoming teaching parents as well as provider parents. So, could you elaborate on that a little bit? For over a hundred years, slave owners had been arguing over the issue of whether slaves would be better, easier to handle if they were baptized and made Christian. And there were three things they could not be taught, allowed to deal with. That was anything political, anything economic, or anything social. Now, social might surprise some people, but social determines who you can marry, if you can marry, how you can marry, uh, uh, and they couldn't deal with that. And of course, it was the master's job to house them and feed them so they, for the economic and the political. But the most damaging part was the responsibility of taking care of every need of the family. I mean, that, uh, and the, uh, the Black Christian was relieved of that obligation. I mean, uh, and it still hasn't basically changed. Um, and, and it's got to be dealt with. The Ten Commandments are designed to rebuild a broken society. After four or five hundred years of slavery in Egypt, the Israelites were a broken society. The Blacks in America, after years of slavery and segregation, which is worse than slavery, is a broken people. The Ten Commandments are designed to rebuild a broken people, to rebuild broken families. Jesus Christ is the one that came up with the theory, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's love expressing itself. That's what the mission is designed 
to do. Many thanks to Tom and Tissa Lair for uh, doing the videotaping for that day and for Patrick Lair for his amazing uh, video editing. Um, I'm going to hand it back now to Prinny Anderson to close us out for the afternoon. Thank you, Suzanne. And to quote something I saw in the chat, as I got to the end of listening to James Meredith, amen, amen, ashe, aho. And a reminder that the video will be available on the YouTube channel, the Coming to the Table YouTube channel. There will be another video that is with background information, some additional documents, and I'm gonna see if we can excerpt the links and book titles from the chat and make those available as well. So, huh, my heart is full of thank yous. And um, first of all, thank you to the audience. I think Meredith M Coleman McGee said, thank you for spending part of your Sunday with us. We loved having your company. Um, from myself and from the Link descendants, we send love and greatest respect to James Meredith for his courage and commitment to love and healing and for his work to overcome white supremacy. I send my love and my excitement to the Meredith and Campbell families for the steps they've already taken to be together today and for everything that I've been hearing they have planned for the future. And, for, and uh, thank you and hugs all around to John, Tracy, Judy, Tom, Tissa, Patrick, GB, Suzanne, Meredith, and all the other members of the families for everything that they've put in to the program. And so I say good afternoon and good evening from coming to the table in the Link Descendants to all of you.